so this first section is, in, is using an integral this net chain, <coughs> figuring out how fast things are changing from integration. This is probably the most general use of integration. Um, the first ones, the first examples we all deal with are all about motion. Um, there are a few formulas. Displacement is how far away from you from where you started, and that is the integral from a to b of the velocity over time. Tells you how far away you are from started from time a to time b. Okay, total distance traveled is not the same thing as displacement. Total distance traveled is the absolute value of the velocity. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But the difference between displacement and total distance traveled is huge. The Indianapolis 500, if the car that wins the race is the one that was in the pole position, its total displacement between the drop of the the green flag and the drop of the checkered flag is zero. Its distance traveled is 500 miles, but its displacement is zero because it is in the exact same place it was when it started the race. It crosses the line when the green flag drops, it crosses the line when the checkered flag stops. It's at the same freaking place. Its displacement is zero. Its distance traveled is 500. Displacements and distance, total distance traveled are not the same thing. Be very careful about that. That's probably the most confused item. And they are extremely close in the problems that you have in, in the formulas. Absolute value of the velocity or the velocity. There is a difference between the two of them. But we will have something today that will really illustrate that. Change in velocity is the integral of the acceleration. And the last one on there, don't forget the items we did previously with motion. Remember, we took derivatives to find, let's say, velocity or acceleration. If we were given where it is, we could figure out how fast it was moving and how fast it's accelerating. Well, guess what? Now we can go in the opposite direction. Take the antiderivatives or integrate. I can give you velocity and you can give me where. So we can go back and forth between them. There's going to be a lot of problems that are going to ask you questions where you're given the velocity and you're going to have to answer questions about acceleration and position. They all relate to each other. Derivatives and antiderivatives. That's what this is about of the same concepts. Don't forget everything we've already done because those will be tied into what we're doing here. This is three new things to go with, with, with movement. We've already covered a lot of other stuff to deal with movement. Okay. So our first example together. A particle is moving along the x-axis, the velocity v of t is equal to t squared minus 7t plus 10, with t is between 0 and 10. So time starts at zero on movement time always starts at zero or never gets less than zero it might start at a different point depending on what we have going on but they usually give an interval for when this is accurate when the velocity is accurate when that equation is accurate because it's usually only accurate for a certain amount of time part a find when the particle is stopped moving to the left and moving to the right okay when it is stopped Velocity is equal to zero. Right? Because it's not moving. No velocity. Moving to the left, moving to the right. Moving to the left, velocity is less than zero. Moving to the right, velocity is greater than zero. Because that's what it's going to be doing. It's one of those three things. If motion is involved, it's either moving one way, moving the other way, or it's not moving at all. Those are the only three possibilities. Positive, negative, zero. How do you find those out? Find the zeros. That's what you start with. 
where is velocity equal to zero? Where t squared minus 7t plus 10 is equal to zero. Set t minus 2, t minus 5 equal to zero. So at t equals 2, and 5 is where the velocity is equal to zero. That's where it stops. So it stopped at t equals 2 and t equals 5. Now, the best way to find the other stuff is just by interval, set up a sign chart. I love sign charts. 2, 0, 5, 10. I know it's not moving here, it's not moving there. We don't care what happens less than zero. We don't care what happens more than 10. We just want to know in the intervals what, what's going on with it. So what do I do? Pick a point in those intervals and test them. And test them in your factored version because that's easier. So like one, one is between zero and two. That's an easy number. Plug in one. 1 minus 2 is negative, 1 minus 5 is negative, a negative times a negative is a positive. Pick a number between 2 and 5, 3, 4, five and a, four, 4 and a half. You can pick any number you want. Pick an easy number, 3. 3 minus 2 is positive, 3 minus 5 is negative, a positive times a negative is negative. Number larger than 5, 7. 7 minus 2 is positive. 7 minus 5 is positive. Positive times a positive is a positive. So all you need to do, figure out the sign chart. Plug it in. Is it positive or negative? When it's positive, what's it doing? It's moving to the right. Okay, so it's moving to the right. It's moving to the right. It's moving to the left. So we have a really good idea what's happening with this particle. It starts at one spot. Moves to the right for the first two seconds, stops, starts moving to the left for the next three, and then stops, and then starts moving back to the right for the next five. We got a really good idea what's going on with this thing. We don't know where, but we have an idea what's happening with it. Okay. So it's moving to the left from two to five. It's moving to the right from zero, actually I've got my zero to two, and from five to ten. And at two and five, it's not moving in either direction. At two and five, it stops. Okay. So, and this is important information more for the last question here rather than the next one. Next one says, if the particle starting position was x equals 4, where did it stop? So it starts at 4. And then from there we have how, what is its displacement? The displacement doesn't tell me where it is. The displacement tells me how far away from where it started. So if I know where it started, I just take its displacement and add it to where I started from. So that's the integral from 0 to 10 of v of t dt. And you do that on your calculators. Or you can do it by hand because it's a relatively easy one to do by hand. I'm OK with either way. I really don't care. I'm going to be honest with you. Here's what I'm looking for on your test. Well, on your quizzes. And this is what AP is also looking for on these. They're looking for that and the answer. Okay. Usually, this might this is either a two or three point question. Usually they give one point for having an integral for the displacement. So you get one point for this part of the equation. And then you get one point for the answer. 
sometimes they will give a point for this, a point for this, and a point for the answer, but usually it's only two points, one for having the integral, one for having the answer. So even if you don't have the, the initial condition thrown in there, which is what this is, or the initial position, if you have the integral for how for the displacement, that will give you a point for that. And literally, this is fine here. Notice I did not put the equation in. I put the integral of the velocity. Because you're given the velocity as part of it, then you find that. Okay. Anybody do this one yet? What'd you get? 120.9? That seems a little... You got 87? Plus the 4? 87, 87. So you're a little off. No, 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 but no, no, seriously, because <laughs> I haven't worked it out yet. Forgot what the answers were, and that's okay. Uh, but I'm more interested in the setup. But 87 point, what? Three, and that'd be close enough for anything we're doing in here. Um, and if you don't have your calculator, although you need to know how to use your calculator for this one because uh, that is what you will be doing on the AP test and your calculator is what you will be able to use on my test. If you don't happen to have your calculator but you happen to have your phone, you can do integrals on Desmos. You type in the integral and it doesn't graph it, it just solves it. Which is really kind of nice. Because actually, I will pull that up rather than dig up my calculator where I'm doing the answer key on a test. I will actually pull up Desmos and have Desmos do it for me. Because it's easier, strictly because I have it in front of me on my computer. But I do know how to do it on my calculator. Okay. Now, the next one what was the total distance that the particle traveled? Well, the total distance is the integral from 0 to 10 of the absolute value of the velocity. And but doing that on your calculator can be extremely difficult. Those straight line bars, your calculators all have a nice little straight line bar on it. That is not an absolute value bar. It's not like you put one in the front and one in the back and it takes the absolute value. That's not what that's for. It will freak out on you. Absolute value is a type in ABS parentheses or find the function in there. And it's a pain. And sometimes you can't do that. And if you have this as a non-calculator question. You cannot take the integral of the absolute value. You can't do it by hand. What you need to do is you need to break it up. It's moving from 0 to 2 one direction. Take the absolute value of that. That's how far it moved while it was moving initially to the right. And then it stops. And then it moves to the left from 2 to 5. And rather than counting it as a negative, I'm counting it as an absolute value of that so I can figure out the total distance of travel. It traveled this far to the right traveled this far to the left, and then it travels that far to the right again. Okay. So, Displacement is how far displacement is how far away it is from where it started. Total distance is how, how how far it actually went to get there. So once again, when you get your butt out of bed in the morning until you go back to sleep tonight, your displacement is zero. Because you start and stop at the same place. But you got up, you wandered around the house, you came to school, you wandered around campus. You went back home, you wandered around the house again, or did other stuff in between. Maybe you went to work, who knows? But the total distance travel is a whole different thing altogether. 
Okay. So if you have to do this, you can do this on your calculator. You can do the ABS. It's under a function key usually. Or AB, type in ABS for absolute value. That's how most calculators work. And then put parentheses around the function that will do the absolute value of the function. Or if you have one where you're not doing your calculator, let's say it's a non-calculator problem, you need to break it up into where it's moving in one direction, where it's moving in another direction, which is where the answers from this one, part one, came from. This is how far it moved to the right. This is how far it moved to the left. This is how far it moved to the right again. You add those three up, that's how far it's moved to get from where it started to where it ended. Okay, and that's what you have to be able to think about. Questions? Okay, so this next portion. You're welcome. Okay. Now, because this is, you need another one? Okay. So to make it easy on you, I printed up the graph, printed up the problems, rather than having you try to write down the graph in your notes. So this is a graph of the velocity. When you have problems with graphs, pay extremely close attention to what this graph graph is of. This is a graph of the velocity. How you answer the questions is based upon it as being the velocity. If this was a graph of, let's say, position, or graph based, uh, or a graph of the acceleration, you would answer the questions differently. This is based on velocity, so that's the velocity you need to know. That I can ask lots of questions about a graph of the velocity, okay? And you have to understand what the, what it is. Pay very close attention. First thing you do when you read a problem. There's particular key information. That is one of them. So this is velocity over time. Okay, the part will start at x equals 3 and ends at t equals 0. Two questions. Find where the particle is at the end of the trip. Find the total distance traveled. Okay, and remember, the 0 is right down the middle of your graph. So take a minute, see if you can figure out using the information we did before because you can tie back to your definitions for displacement and total distance traveled. And you don't need the equation because the graph will give you the same information. Okay, so, so here's, here's what you have to remember. You're trying to find the area under the curve. Because remember, we talked about that, integration of area. The first few problems we did doing integrals was calculating the area using geometry. Now, I have students that will figure out, okay, from here to here, this is the line, so this is the function that's involved. You can't always do that, and it's not really worth it. What I do on this one, I look at this, I go, area above, area below, I want to keep them separate. I would call this area A. This one B, C, and D, and break it down into parts. And then this is a freaking triangle. This is a trapezoid that's a triangle that's a triangle. You should remember the formulas for areas of triangles and trapezoids. And you figure them out accordingly. So, for example, the area of A is 1 half times 2 times 1. 
which is 1. Now, I'm not assigning a sign to it, plus or minus. I'm just finding the area of that triangle. B is a little more complicated. It's 1 half times the height, which is 2, times base 1 plus base 2, 3 plus 4.75. Multiply them out and add them together, 7.75. That's for the trapezoid. Area C would be 1 half times 4 times 2.25, which ends up being 4.5 for that triangle. And then the last one, D, is 1 half times 1 times 2, or 1 again. And then everything else is strictly from here, a matter of adding or subtracting is necessary. Counting it as positive or negative. Okay, so for the first one, for A, question A. Find out where the particle is at the end of the trip. So for A, you have it starts at 3. So you have where it started from, and then you have its displacement. Its displacement is adding those together accordingly. So it would be plus negative 1, because the first triangle is underneath, plus positive 7.75. Because B is above the x-axis. Plus negative 4.5. Plus negative 1. And you add all those together. So let's see. Negative 1, negative 1, and 3 give me 1. So that's 8.75 minus 4.5 gives me 4.25. That's where it is when it stops. Part B or question B is total distance traveled. I don't care where it started. I just want to know how far how how far it actually got to be there. How many steps are on its are on its Fitbit? Okay, not where it is, but how many steps are on the Fitbit? So that would be the absolute value of negative one plus the absolute value of seven point. 7.5, 7.75, only one decimal, not two, plus the absolute value of negative 4.5, plus the absolute value of negative 1. What did you have to do? So 7.75 plus 4.5 is 11.75 plus 1 half would be 12 and a quarter, plus 2 is 13 and a quarter, plus 1 is 14 and a quarter. That's why. Bless you. Bless you. Is that good? So you get the idea. This is not an uncommon problem. Do not try to figure out the equations for the lines and go from there. That is, and there are times when you want to do that and times when you don't. Something like this, this is easy enough to figure out the area. They give you enough information to do that. Often what they will do is they will give you a graph, and they will tell you what the numbers are on the graph, so to speak, or the heights or something like that, and they will give you the other information. And you need to figure it out from the areas. So you'll see all kinds of stuff. So you, have to be able to, you have to be able to figure these out, even if you don't have the equations. You will be given enough information to figure out the problems one way or another. But you don't always need the equations to solve the problems. Don't get stuck on that. I've had a lot of students that if I give them something that they can't figure out the equations, but I tell them this area, this area, this area, they go, oh, I can't do that because I need the equation. No, you don't. The areas are what counts sometimes. Yeah. Oh, I need three for, uh, for the first three. It wasn't for the first one. Three was where it was at the end of the trip. Find where. That's what I use the three from, from where it began. So this is the starting point. It starts here, and then this is how far it moves from the starting point. Okay? Okay, last one. 
If we have an equation that describes the rate, how fast something is changing over a period of time, gallons per hour, miles per hour, bushels per year is what the rate is here. The integral of the rate is equal to how much? Consume 32 milkshakes per hour. How many milkshakes did he consume in an hour and a half? If you have a rate, you can figure out how much. That's what this is. That's the basic, con basic, basic, basic concept. The integral of the rate is equal to how much? So, from 1970 to 1980, the rate of potato consumption in a particular country was C of T is equal to 2.2, I know it's hard to read, 2.2 plus 1.1 to the T. 2.2 plus 1.1 to the T. Putting that in the exponent screws the ever getting the chances of doing an antiderivative by hand. I have zero expectations of this one ever being solved by hand. This is a straight up calculator problem. So it's C of T bushels per year the T being the year since the beginning of 1970s. So a lot of hash browns, potato chips, and mashed potatoes, and really greasy, cheesy scalloped potatoes because there wasn't a lot of other stuff in the early 70s. And mashed potatoes. Boil. It's not like nowadays. You can have all kinds of things. How many bushels were consumed from the beginning of 1972 to the end of 1973? The key to this problem is the setup. The most difficult part of this problem is the bounds. Because it doesn't start at zero. When does the equation begin its accuracy? 1970. The beginning of 1970 is time zero. The first two years is not necessarily the same consumption as the last two years. This is not a linear equation. This is not a solid straight line horizontal one because that's the only type of equation where this, the amount of the beginning two times two part, part of the time period would be the same distance in the next time period. Because if you stop and think about it, okay, this is an exponential equation. And the area under here from 0 to 2 is not the same as the area here from 8 to 10. So getting the timeline right is very important. You can't just go, oh, oh, 72 to 73, that's a year. That's zero to one. Because that will be completely inaccurate. That will be completely inaccurate. So we have an integral. And the how much, the rate, this is your rate. So it's the integral of 2.2 plus 1.1 to the t dt. That's easy enough. The rate integrated gives me how much. i got to figure out when to start and when to stop. That's the hard part. Okay, does that make sense? And often in these problems, that is the most difficult thing, is figuring out the bounds. Okay. Um, so the beginning of 1972, if the beginning of 1970 is time zero, the beginning of 1972 would be time what? Time 2. 
So it goes from 2, and then from the beginning of 1972 to the end of 73. So the end of 73 would be what? 4. Because you're going one, 0 to 1, 70 to 71, and it's that time change between 70 and 71, right? End of 70, beginning of 71 is where 1 is. The end of 71, beginning of 72 is 2. 72, 73, 73, 74, that's time 4. So it's 2 to 4 of the integral of 2.2 plus 1.1 to the t. Please do that on your calculator. Because doing that on your doing that by hand is not on impossible. Huh. Yeah, doing the antiderivative on an exponential is really freaking hard. It can be done, but it's really hard. So you should get 7.066, and that's in bushels per year, and although I think it's like millions of bushels is what it's supposed to be. Oh, now it makes sense. Yeah, seven bushels in the country. That's a really small freaking country. You only eat seven bushels in two years' time. They don't, they don't I mean, that's them. really, really small because a bushel, you know what a bushel is, right? A bushel basket. No, a bushel basket. And this is where it was. A bushel basket was a standard unit of measurement. It was a bushel basket was the same size. They're about that big around, and they're about that deep. That's a bushel. A bushel basket. That's literally what it was. It was a basket. And how many of those baskets was what you got paid by? So bushel basket is where the term bushels came from. And it's a unit of measurement. They still use that. Although they really don't so much. They still kind of do, but they don't. They will actually buy it by the pound. They don't do the volume so much anymore. They do it by the weight. But the idea is a bushel basket, like I said, it's about that big around, about that deep. Fill up a bushel basket of potatoes. It's going to take either one really big guy or a couple of people to carry it because they're that big but of corn or something like that it wouldn't weigh so much and yeah that's what it would be <laughs> so seven of those that's a really tiny country really tiny. i actually do think it's millions could be billions i can't remember off the top of my head billions of bushes yeah i mean there are households that eat that in two years time <laughs> seriously Potatoes aren't that expensive, relatively speaking, aren't that expensive. They got a lot of calories for their size. And and if you've got a large family, I know some large families, they put they potatoes in every meal, that'd be no problem to knock it out. Yeah. None at all. No problem. <laughs> okay. So that gives you what you need to do. 